Churchill famously said, we shall not flag or fail, we shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France, we shall fight in the seas and in the oceans. Uh, I'm sorry. We shall fight with great confidence in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the hills. We shall never surrender. This must have been a boost to our parents and our grandparents who having survived World War I, we're now facing another world war. Dunkirk take place, it takes place and with the Nazis tightening their grip throughout Europe, the occupied people were really just concentrating on survival. Britain is standing alone. Here, Hugh Dalton here was the Minister of Economic Warfare and really had the idea and was given the task to form Britain's Special Operations Executive espionage and sabotage group. From now on, I will refer to it as the SOE. He described it as such. What is needed is a new organization to coordinate, inspire, control, and assist the nationals of the oppressed countries. We need a certain fanatical enthusiasm and willingness to work with people of different nationalities. And this was when Churchill spoke the famous words and now set Europe ablaze. 1940 was looking grim. Uh, the Luftwaffe was pounding the capital. London was ablaze and not Europe as Churchill was intending. Uh, indeed, uh, Churchill had said, whatever burns in London, uh, St. Paul's must not go. And there were firefighters on the roof of St. Paul's throwing off incendiary devices to make sure it didn't burn. So now, now let's find out how this clandestine organization worked. Uh, the head office was in 64 Baker Street, staffed by all Brits. Um, the plaque outside didn't actually, that's obviously a modern plaque saying uh, this was where the Special Operations Executive ran from. Uh, but during wartime, it couldn't say that. So it had a plaque which said, Inter-Services Research Bureau. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. So let's have a look at some of the key players. Uh, here we have probably the most important uh, brigadier, Sir General Colin Gubbins. Uh, he was the executive director and the first man to be called M. Throughout all of SOE's trials and tribulations, uh, and all of its triumphs, Gubbins was a great source of inspiration and a great leader of young men and young women. And of course, this was a young person's job. I think it's so brilliant that we in Britain have such an important major general and his name is Gubbins. Um, any other nation would have had a quick name change to Brutus or something, but no, Britain has got Gubbins. Um, working with uh, many others, here is Maurice Buckmaster, Colonel Maurice Buckmaster, head of the French section. I'm really just showing him because there was a lovely quote uh, which, uh, from Hitler, which said, when I get to London, I do not know who I shall hang first, Churchill or this man Buckmaster. Uh, working with him uh, was Vera Atkins. Uh, she was of Jewish Romanian descent, uh, uh, previously worked for SIS, which of course is the Spooks, MI5, MI6. Uh, she became a great mother figure to the agents and would make sure uh, any families in this country received um, letters previously written and that sort of thing. Uh, there were also uh, in the head office, uh, um, was ran with the sectarials, uh, jobs and the uh, codes and driving and this sort of thing. The first aid nursing yeoman. Uh, this is, uh, sadly, the initials for that come out, spell out the word Fanny. Uh, I know they giggled about it at the time and they must still giggle about it because the Fannies are an all-women regiment set up to 
support any sort of disaster that happens in this country. So now let's go on to the uh, important and uh, interesting thing about training up in Scotland. Colin Gubbins had spent much of his youth on the Isle of Mull, uh, where his grandparents lived, and he realised the benefits uh, of the Highland life and the training it would give. Um, here we have uh, Glen Finnan with its high mountains and its deep locks. Uh, it's one of the most wonderful places in the world, in, in my view. Uh, but the, uh, for training, it was ideal. To begin with, the SOE trained with the commandos in Loch Islet, and then they moved down the road to Arasaig House, which is a very nice uh, country house hotel if you're ever in that area. Very proud of its SOE connections. So now we're going on to finding out about my father. When I give a talk on the SOE, I only usually bring in the fact that I have a father that was in the SOE uh, right at the end of the talk. But on this occasion here, he comes in uh, close to the beginning. Uh, his father was Dutch, his mother was English, so uh, he, his nickname, well, his surname was Van Morick or Van Marik, and his nickname was Van. So I will just refer to my father usually as Van. Uh, to begin with, before the war, he was a member of the Artist Rifles, which was the forerunner to the SAS. He spoke fluent German and French, and therefore, and with a Dutch name as well, he was soon picked up by the SOE as a possible uh, candidate to join. But he was sent up to Arasaig in 1941, and uh, soon found himself setting up Houses. Uh, here we have uh, Garamore House and Try House. Uh, to begin with, he ran uh, a course for French and then he went on to uh, train the Czechs. So these are the two houses where, where the courses were run from. Uh, you saw uh, Arasaig House, that was the main house, but these other sort of satellite houses were used so that other nationalities didn't know who was there. So the Czechs didn't know the French were there and the French didn't know the Polish were there, that sort of thing, kept very separate. Um, the, actually the view from the Trey House, I mean, this is a stunning part of Scotland. It isn't that lovely. So this was the sort of uh, land they were training in. Uh, and just, just along from there was uh, Karmus Darach, which is the house that the Czechs uh, lived in. So, of course, this training included the two very famous people, Jan Kubisch and Josef Kapcik, which, of course, this is a whole reason for being here. So here they are, and they look so young and... Um, well, they just look so young and innocent, don't they, in that picture. So Arasay gathered together the best instructors in the country, the best shots, the ghillies who taught them how to survive out in the countryside. They were taught how to, um, well, every conceivable form of sabotage, unarmed com combat, um, radio communication skills, self-confidence, leadership skills, everything they would need for uh, their coming operations. As I said, this area was ideal for paramilitary training. Um, this is the sort of countryside, uh, and although I show that, that was not right, because that man would never be sitting at the top of the mountain like that. He would soon be shot, wouldn't he? <laughs> so some of the interesting characters who uh, were training the Czechs. Uh, here we have Johnny Romensky, who is a notorious Scottish burglar and safecracker. He had to be released from Glasgow's Barlini jail, but he could teach the agents all sorts of interesting techniques, like how to blow up a safe 
uh, quietly without anyone noticing. And beautiful things like how to get out of handcuffs, all the things that he was very good at. <laughs> also, very famously, uh, two men called the Shanghai Busters, uh, Major William Fairburn and Captain Eric Sykes. Uh, they had previously been working uh, for the police in Shanghai, which is, was China's chaotic and violent city. Uh, these two men were too old to fight themselves, but they came over to this country and they taught techniques. Uh, they called it made a murder made easy, which uh, reading quite a bit about it, some of the te techniques were pretty, pretty horrific, but they were useful and we, uh, at that point, uh, the agents were saying, well, um, should we really be fighting like this? You know, we, this world wasn't used to this sort of thing. But they said, if you think our methods are not cricket, remember, Hitler does not play cricket. <laughs> and nor does Putin, actually, does he? So the agents were taught to kill their opponent as quickly as possible. The training included attacking or practicing to attack the railway line which runs from Fort William to Malay. This is the Jacobite train, uh, famously today uh, in the Harry Potter uh, movies. Uh, but in those days, what, well, in fact, my father was training them to do uh, something called a fog switch would be put onto the tracks, the engine would go over, and uh, in training, there was a puff of smoke. Uh, but as time went on, uh, in other countries, uh, occupied countries, that switch would have dynamite underneath it and the engine would be off the tracks. But in training, uh, the train drivers enjoyed being blown up and they would put their thumbs up out of the, uh, the engines and say, yes, they enjoyed it. At the end of the Czechs course, uh, expressing their gratitude to Van, uh, he was presented with a book called Letters from England. I don't know if any of you Czechs uh, know this book, by Karl Kapic. I apologize for the pronunciation of your Czech names. Uh, but this was um, a book which was blacklisted by the Nazis. Uh, and in this book, in September 41, uh, all the students of that f first course were uh, to sign it to thank my father. My father's name at the top and 20 signatures below it. Uh, but luckily, I have a, uh, those are the, uh, the names. Uh, number two is Jan Kabish. Apparently, Joseph Kavchik was not there because he was to be on the next course, so he didn't actually get to sign that book. Uh, that book is now uh, held in the Imperial War Museum. George Burfield's uncle, which some of you were here uh, to hear, uh, Joseph Kublik, Kublik, Kublik um, is number 11. There, right down at the bottom, if you can see it. Uh, and George had very kindly uh, allowed me to show uh, a couple of pictures. His grandfather, Jaroslav Kublik, is sitting uh, on the far right there. And here we have number 16, which is Joseph Kublik. Bublik. Kublik, I get Bublik. it right. Uh, it's there at the bottom left. Uh, he was also involved in um, Anthropoid, Operation Anthropoid, and he um, sadly was tracked down in Prague and killed. Another photo from, uh, from George. Here is his grandfather on the right, and Aldrich Dvorak. Thank you. <laughs> uh, here on the left, uh, he was... Uh, uh, been shown by Joroslav how to, um, was trained as a radio operator. 
very, very sadly, Aldrich here on the left, uh, he was so young, uh, but he was on the point of being captured and he committed suicide. The monument at Speen Bridge, which is just by um, Fort William, is really to the commandos. Uh, it is stunning if any of you have been there, but I, I feel it's not only the, to the commandos, but it's all to all the, uh, the soldiers who uh, train in those Scottish hills. So once they finished their training up in Scotland, uh, they would go for parachute training, which happened at Ringway near Manchester, uh, either jumping from a small aeroplane or from a tethered balloon. And after five jumps, they were ready to go. They had their parachute wings and uh, they were off. Now, radio communication was very important. They were being taught this. Uh, many of them, well, they would all go down to other houses in England and um, have further training about which countries they were going to be in. But as I said, radio communication was essential to keep in touch with London. Uh, it was the most vulnerable and dangerous job for uh, an agent. Because the Gestapo were trying to track down uh, the radio operators, uh, they had vans which looked like uh, laundry vans or baker's vans and trying to pinpoint where a radio was being uh, work operated from. The survival time of uh, a radio operator, the average survival time was just three months. Back in London in Baker Street, the Fannies were there uh, working tirelessly uh, waiting and sending messages and receiving messages from uh, the men in the field, uh, receiving troop movements and information about uh, future air drops. Uh, Neil Marx was head of uh, codes. He was a young man at the time. Sadly, I don't have him as a photo of him as a young man. Here he is in later times. Uh, he was to uh, write code poems and eventually devise the system of having uh, codes on silk which could be torn off, burnt and totally forgotten. Now at the end of this sort of training, of course my father was promoted down, I don't say of course, my father was promoted down to Baker Street uh, eventually to become a staff officer to Gubbins. Uh, he was subsequently parachuted into France uh, to, with the express uh, intention of getting into Switzerland to run uh, the SOE agents from Switzerland. His students in Arasaig, the Czechoslovakians, uh, of course, were parachuting into uh, Prague at this point. Uh, it was only during my father's time in Baker Street that he was to learn what had happened. I just have a few minutes to talk about another mission which was uh, very important, which happened in Norway, which some of you will know about, uh, with the heavy water factory. Uh, Norway was uh, neutral and was uh, invaded by the Nazis and Vidkum Quisling, here chatting to Hitler, was uh, put in as the uh, leader of the Norwegians, the Nazi leader. And here he is again. Intelligence had filtered through from uh, Norway to Britain that there was a uh, there was a factory in Norway which was producing heavy water. And this was an important part of the atomic bomb. And Britain did not like the thought of this at all, uh, and nor did uh, the America. Uh, and Churchill had been across to Roosevelt to visit Roosevelt, and both of them were very alarmed because uh, the Germany was ahead of the, rush of the uh, race to uh, produce the atomic bomb. We were way behind. 
uh, if that had, if he had succeeded, or they had succeeded, uh, I certainly wouldn't be here because the young woman to be my mother would have been London, and London would have been the first place to have been bombed. So seriously, there was this feud by the War Cabinet uh, that Churchill ordered the SOE as a matter of highest possible priority to deal with this threat. So this factory was in the uh, region of Telemark, west of Oslo. Here is the lo largest, loneliest, wildest area in northern Europe. Uh, only locals knew how to survive up in these conditions. In this factory, there was uh, an engineer who was becoming very alarmed at the amount of heavy water being produced. Before the war, it was being used as a, for fertilizers and this sort of thing, but now the Nazis were making this factory produce more and more. So this engineer went to his boss and said, I'm overworked, I need a couple of weeks holiday skiing, please can I go? And amazingly, he was allowed to do that. But instead of going skiing, he hijacked a boat to Britain. Uh, quickly, he was put in touch with the SOE. He gave them details so they could uh, do an exact model for training purposes and within and also he was taught how to parachute and use a radio. And within that, those two weeks, he was back, back in Norway saying, thank you very much, I've had a good couple of weeks uh, skiing. Now, Norwegians were also trained up in Scotland, some of them more up in Aviemore because the conditions were more like uh, the, the Norwegian uh, conditions up there. So this is the first team, uh, the Grouse uh, team, and they were sent to prepare the way. Now their task was to receive 34 commandos who were coming in, in two large gliders. I know that Baker Street were a bit alarmed about these uh, gliders coming in because it hadn't really worked very well before, but indeed, they should, be alarmed, should have been alarmed because the rope that was connecting the gliders to the aeroplanes uh, froze and snapped and both gliders crashed. The uh, lucky ones were the men that were killed on impact. The unlucky ones were eventually um, tortured and executed on Hitler's orders. But this task could not fail. Six more hand-picked Norwegians, and much like the Ukrainians and the Czechoslovakians, they were really tough men, um, determined to uh, free their country, even if it meant they were going to die. So this team was called the Gunnerside team. Uh, they were parachuted in this time and eventually met up with the Grouse team and uh, set off to uh, attack their target. Now, of course, one mission had failed, so the Nazis had minefields all the way around the factory. The only way in was a 75-foot suspension bridge, totally guarded. But there was a precipice, or you can see the precipice there um, at the bottom of the picture, and they deemed that no one could climb that. But of course, the SOE had been training the men to climb precipices in Scotland, and this was the way into the factory. On the 27th of February, 43, the team set off. They skied down to the base of the precipice. They left their skis hoping they might be back, but each man had a cyanide pill because if they were captured or injured in any way, they had no hope. And one bite on a cyanide pill would have brought death within minutes. Soon they were into the factory that they knew so well uh, because of the uh, training they'd had on the, the model that had been given to them and into the central 
uh, area where the uh, heavy mortar was being produced, holding the uh, night watchman at gunpoint and putting the bombs onto the components that needed to be blown up. They put very short fuses because they wanted to make sure they went off. So they were out of that central uh, area and still in the factory when they heard a dull thud and knew that the bombs had gone off. A guard came out, shone a torch about and thought it was probably falling snow and went back in. Uh, the men went back down the way they'd come up and skied like Billio uh, away from the factory. And the storm broke and they were skiing. They could hear the sirens going off in the mountains way, way behind them. And they said that, of course, Norwegian uh, winter was a friend to them because soon a snowstorm came through and all their tracks were hidden. Eventually, a message was sent back to London saying, attacked, high concentration plant totally destroyed, all present, no fighting. Uh, Baker Street were ecstatic and Churchill delighted and impressed, saying his faith in his secret army was both justified and enhanced. Sadly, it wasn't the end of the story because about eight weeks later, they get the factory up and running again and the American Air Force come in and bomb the factory. Two interesting things here. The Americans were not in the war at this point, but they still, presumably with uh, Roosevelt's uh, permission, come in and bomb the factory. And also, you may say, why didn't they just uh, bomb the factory in the first place? But that wasn't the way the SOE did things. It was better to get in there, uh, to place bombs where they should have been, and it meant locals weren't killed. And at the end of the war, the, uh, the factory would be up and running again. But, and, and actually, uh, they found, presumably way down in the basement, there were still some uh, barrels containing heavy water. This information was uh, relayed to Knut, who was part of the gunner side team, and his job was to deal with the final piece or barrels of heavy water. Uh, Hitler, apoplectic with rage, would put it mildly, uh, ordered that his final barrels of heavy water should be transported back to Germany. Uh, they were put onto a train. Part of the route for the train was to go through uh, onto a ferry, and this is where Knut put the bombs and the final barrels of heavy water disappeared into the water. So I just went through that really just um, as another example of how successful the SOE were. There were occasions when it went awfully wrong and uh, men and women died, but that was another success. Back to, um, back to Arasaig, that lovely view again, and that is the view, view as, as I said, from Trey House. And there, there was a plaque which was unveiled uh, when my father was still alive, and on the plaque it says, uh, Special Forces for the Army of Czechoslovakia received training here and at Camus Darek House and Garamore in 1941 to 43, prior to operations in their homeland against the German Nazi invaders. Uh, this is a group of men who unveiled the plaque. Uh, there's a Czech defense attaché and a Slovak defense attaché there, and there uh, in the middle, which I'll get in a bit closer, uh, is my father. Um, beside him uh, is Major General Antonin, Antonin Petrak. 
uh, he was, uh, became very close to my father, and my father greatly admired him. Uh, he took over instructing the checks after my father went down to uh, Baker Street. So the unveiling of the check memorial, there it is being unveiled uh, in, on the 11th of October 2009. It was unveiled by the Right Honourable George Reid, Lord High Commissioner, uh, and a sizable delegation were there from the Czech Republic. Here we have, I don't know if any of you know this man, Colonel Jaroslav Klemes. Klemes, thank you. He was an Arasaig veteran and he read the remembrance. He said to Czech and Slovak soldiers trained as SOE in 1941 to 43 and sustaining heavy casualties. Beside the plaque are uh, names of all the Czechs and Slovaks trained in Arasaig. Uh, the memorial depicts a fallen parachute sculptured by Joseph Vajic. Thank you. In Czech granite by stonemasons in Prague. There's a, hopefully a new information board going up this summer, which will uh, give people who are visiting the area a bit of information about the Czechs and what happened. And also the land, sea, and island centre in Czech, uh, in Arasaig uh, remembers the agents and the training that they underwent or undertook in the area. I just have to say on my own part uh, that throughout this there was a bit of a love story going on. Uh, there is my father uh, who going down to Baker Street to work before he was parachuted into France, met this Scottish uh, fanny called Winifred Hay and after a bad start they were to fall in love and marry. So these are my parents, so I have a double whammy uh, SOE. So while I say the final words of this talk, let me show you a few lovely sides of, slides of the Arasaic area uh, where the Czechs, the Czechoslovakians trained, how they must have appreciated this wonderful scenery uh, before they headed into the terrifying world of World War II. Len Finnan again. And the words of General Gubbins at the end of the war, he said, successful sabotage operations required, required surprise, speed, and mobility. The most effective operations were those undertaken in stealth and at night. When the time for action comes, act with the greatest boldness and audacity. And that is exactly what Operation Anthropoid was all about. So I'll end the code with a code poem written by Leo Marx, uh, which really has become synonymous with the SOE. The life that I have is all that I have, and the life that I have is yours. The love that I have of the life that I have is yours and yours and yours. A sleep I shall have, a rest I shall have, yet death will be but a pause. For the peace of my years in the long green grass will be yours and yours and yours. We will remember them. Thank you. If any, but if you've got time. Okay, thank you very much. And are there any questions? I can never think of any when I'm in an audience. <laughs> All right. I don't know what KB Water is. I mean, what is it? Who actually is it? It is um, 
I, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know exactly, but um, I know that uh, the, uh, the Nazis have taken the uranium mine, mines in Czechoslovakia as well, uh, and these are just important components of the atomic bomb. Okay, thank you. I'll Google it. Yes, Google it. I, I have been told, but it's really very complicated, uh, and it's all how, how you make an atomic bomb. So I haven't gone into the great detail of how to do it, because I don't intend to making one. But, <laughs> but do, yes. But it is an important component of it. Any other question? Well, I have one. This is all about skinned soldiers in adversity, but they were going to a city which they knew amongst people they knew that they had relations there. How did they psychologically train them to deal with the, those realities? Mm. Well, they, we probably don't have the time, but I mean, that's the real question. Yes, exactly. Uh, they would have come down to houses like Bewley uh, down here in southern England, where they went through all sorts of really in-depth training. Uh, first of all, how to recognize all the different uh, Nazi uniforms, uh, how to act. They went through uh, all, every, all sorts of things. They went through honey traps, uh, which were uh, women who would meet an agent in a bar and try to get him to admit that he was an agent and not a toothpaste salesman. Uh, and if he did, that was it. His career was over as an agent. Uh, but they were trained to, uh, you know, these men would have known the area. They would have known Prague because they came from there. They spoke the language perfectly. They had to be people from, um, from that area so they didn't stand out like a sore thumb. They had every training that the SOE could possibly give them, uh, even down to how to hold a cigarette uh, in the way that it was held in that country. The clothes were uh, exactly uh, right for that country. There couldn't be any sign of a British zip or anything like that. They would even go as far as uh, changing the fillings in their teeth to make sure they look the same as they would do in that country. Uh, everything they possibly could to make sure those agents had every opportunity to succeed on their missions. For a single, well, um, I know that up in Arisade they were there five or six weeks. That all? Uh, that was all, but then they were to come back down to, to Bewley or one of many other houses in the, uh, down here. And that, they would go through quite extensive training, which would last uh, many weeks to make sure uh, only when they were ready would they, they go. Um, so it could last uh, quite a few months before they headed off into uh, their operations. Excuse me, it's fair to say that many of them were already trained soldiers. Yes. Yes. I mean, they were with one sergeant, uh, and they'd been in the army for some years. Yes, you're quite right. Many of the Czechs were already, as you say, soldiers. Mm. Uh, other agents were people with languages. Uh, they always had to be bilingual, uh, and a lot of them uh, were not. They were just, they were lawyers, they were doctors, they were secretaries who had the right qualifications to be trained. I remember up in Arisaic hearing about one girl who thought she was going up to Scotland for a, to be a bilingual secretary. Uh, and she found herself yomping across the mountains and wondering what on earth she was doing. But of course, she was being trained. Uh, and there was something like nearly 60 women who, who did this. And that was uh, extremely uh, secret because at that point, women did not fight. Uh, and so that was kept very secret. But yes, you're quite right. The Slovak, 
Czechoslovakians were on the whole already soldiers, which is why they had managed to come all the way to Britain and to continue the fight, which is so admir admirable. I've got one more. Yeah. I went to the Signal Museum in Chesterchurch about a year or back, and I was still amazed at the iron tape they had to carry. To oh, for the, the radio? For the radio. Yes. Weapons or anything, dynamite. Mm. Yes. It's a huge, heavy iron tape. Yes. It's unbelievable. It is, un especially in these days where we've got all mobile phones and yeah. um, everything we could possibly do so quickly and easily. Um, I did... Uh, read about one lady uh, agent in France who had one of these cases full of uh, radio, uh, radio uh, which was like a small suitcase and she got off a train and realised there was a, a checkpoint and if she'd gone through it she would have she would be dead basically um, so she most of them were rather beautiful uh, and she went up to a, a German uh, soldier nearby or officer and started flirting with him. Uh, he, she then asked him if he, she could, if he could possibly carry this case through the checkpoint for her, which he very obligingly did. <laughs> so, <laughs> so these people had to think on, you know, <coughs> uh, really uh, to survive, they had to think of anything that they could possibly do. So you're right, they were very heavy. Yeah. I'm afraid I don't. I I would I could make something up, but I've always never done that. Oh, so. Do Do you know more about it? I, I do actually, yes, because my, my father was in, was involved in that initially. Oh, was he? Yeah, he was one more experience. Oh, right. Oh, confession. Oh, was it? How was it? How was it? Oh, thank you. <laughs> and the second question, actually, um, I come from an area up until the British Royal Air in France, and I gather that was an old tree of the Czech Army. Or yes, I believe there's a memorial yeah, there, too, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, I was talking about that. Yeah, yes. Do you know um, how much time these guys spent, or what they did with all this time, when and how much time they spent in there? I, I'm not sure whether how much time they spent. What, the Czechs, the... That they went on to Operation Anthropoid. They, they probably be, did. They probably went there for training, I, I suspect. Yes. Because they went to all sorts of different places that um, radio, you know, training and uh, all sorts of things that they needed. So, yes, probably were, were there as well. About two years, they were there. About two years. Were they really? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, one last question. like to ask you for one more applause for Jilly because I think she's <laughs>